We have a series of scripture readings this morning, beginning with the prophet Isaiah chapter 46. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been born by me from your birth, carried from the womb. Even to your old age I am he. Even when you turn gray, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear, I will carry and will save. From the Gospel of Matthew chapter 23. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones, those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. From Hosea chapter 13. Yet I have been the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt. You know no God beside me. And beside me there is no Savior. It was I who fed you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. When I fed them, they were satisfied. They were satisfied and their heart was proud. Therefore they forgot me. So I will become like a lion to them. Like a leopard, I will lurk beside the way. I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs and will tear open the covering of their heart. There I will devour them like a lion as a wild animal would mangle them. From Deuteronomy 32. As an eagle stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, as it spreads its wings, takes them up, and bears them aloft on its pinions, the Lord alone guided him. No foreign god was with him. The Lord set him atop the heights of the land and fed him with produce of the field. The Lord nursed him with honey from the crags, with oil from flinty rock. Next month, Pastor Jen and I will mark eight years as co-pastors of Claremont United Church of Christ. And of the... Of the approximately 440 worship services that we have held in that time, from Sunday services to Holy Week to Christmas Eve, one of my all-time favorite services was on October 30th, 2022. That was the day we hosted Pulitzer Prize winning composition Voiceless Mass by indigenous artist Raven Chacon. And that morning is so memorable to me for many reasons. First, Voiceless Mass was an absolutely brilliant and haunting piece that was intended to lift up Native American experiences using the very same structures like church buildings and organs that have been used to suppress and colonize indigenous spirituality. Secondly, the performance of Voiceless Mass that day was the first time that it had ever been performed on the West Coast. Our organ task force here at the church had booked Raven before the piece won the Pulitzer Prize. And when it did, the Los Angeles Museum, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art was so upset that the piece was going to be performed at little old Claremont United Church of Christ before they had a chance to feature it. And they were so upset by this, in fact, that they successfully negotiated that we were not allowed to call it the West Coast Premier so that we didn't have that distinction instead of them. And I forget what we settled on. I think it was the West Coast debut instead. <laughs> Thirdly, in place of a sermon from either me or Pastor Jen that day, Raven wrote and performed an entirely original piece composed just for Claremont UCC so that indigenous voices and creations could be centered throughout the whole service that day. And that piece was also incredibly brilliant and powerful and incorporated the same kind of sounds that had been used to agitate protesters at Standing Rock, where Lakota and Dakota and other Native American communities combined with allies to stand against the construction of a pipeline through their water sources. If you have a chance to watch the service on any of our social media channels, it is absolutely worth your time. But one of the other reasons that the service that day was so memorable, for better or for worse, was the gentleman who stood up 
and interrupted the service. If you were in the sanctuary that day, you will never forget that moment. But as Raven was performing his original piece, a tall young man stood up from the third row on this side, gathered his wife and children, and started pointing and shouting, Shame! Shame on you! How dare you call this a church? This place is not Christian! Shame! Shame! And what made the whole scene worse is that two of his three kids didn't have their shoes on. So he had to pause right there while his wife put their shoes back on. And I don't think he realized how long the chancel is. And so he was walking up the whole length of the channel as people, chancel as people stared at him the whole time shouting, shame, shame, shame. It was seriously straight out of a scene from Game of Thrones. If you know what I'm talking about, it's season five, a religious cult takes over King's Landing and Cersei Lannister has to march through the city with one of the cult leaders yelling shame at her. I pulled up the scene right here. Let's take a look. Shame. 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 Shame! 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 It was seriously just like that in the sanctuary, without the nudity, thankfully, but totally with shame! Shame! Now, most people in the sanctuary that day didn't even blink an eye because they thought the screaming was part of Raven Chacon's performance. His piece was so avant-garde and experimental that someone standing up and doing performance art would have totally made sense that day. After the service, people said that they thought he was shouting shame because he was reenacting the way Christians have treated indigenous spirituality. They thought the whole thing was planned. But people who picked up that it was not part of the service were worried that he was an outside agitator who had maliciously planned to disrupt Raven's performance. But that wasn't the case either. He was simply the very conservative grandson of a church member who had flown here from Tennessee for his grandfather's funeral that we had officiated the day before, and he came to the service with his grandmother who was horrified by his behavior. But knowing who he was, I followed him out of the sanctuary into the narthex where he began yelling at me that we were not a Bible-believing church and that I should be ashamed to call myself a pastor. Once I got him outside, right outside these doors, I finally asked him, what are you so upset about? Did you not hear that man in there? He screamed. He called God mother. I couldn't help but chuckle, and I asked him incredulously, that's why you're mad? Because he called God mother? I was thinking to myself that there are so many more interesting reasons to be upset. I figured it was because we were promoting interfaith relationships or because we fly a rainbow flag on the side of our building or because we had read a land acknowledgement that day or we had also declared that we were a sanctuary church and everyone was safe regardless of their documentation status. But he was upset because of some run-of-the-mill patriarchy? He would go so far as to disrupt a church service to declare that God was a man. Boring. So passe. I wanted to give him a chance to have a rational conversation about it. And so I responded with, did you know that the Bible compares God to a mother again and again throughout the, both the Old and the New Testament? No, it doesn't, he screamed again. I've read the Bible. I've read it too, I said. <laughs> All the way through many times. And yes, it does. He wasn't willing to engage with that idea, so we agreed at that point it was probably best we parted ways, and he went on, and that was that. Our sermon series this month is entitled, Indescribable, the Many Images of God, and we are exploring how even though God is transcendent and beyond the abilities of our limited human language to fully explain Scripture attempts to describe God by using a myriad of images and metaphors, including a whole host of feminine descriptions. 
And so I dedicate today's sermon to angry disruption man because despite his insistence that the Bible does not refer to God as a mother, our scripture readings today are just a small sampling of the number of times it does so. Multiple passages speak of God giving birth, of nursing God's people at God's breast, of God acting as a midwife during labor, and of God caring for God's offspring like a mother eagle or mother hen or mother bear. In fact, God as mother is one of the central images used by the Bible. Now, even though I was bored by angry disruption man's stale patriarchy, the reality of the world's religious landscape is that it is still heavily male-oriented. Anytime we post a sermon clip of Pastor Jen on our YouTube channel, our social media manager Michael can attest that the internet trolls get right to work declaring that women cannot be pastors and that Pastor Jen needs to step down and Michael has to go on and turn off the comments from the post. The long-standing anti-female interpretations of Scripture have become so ingrained in our cultural psyche that despite the fact that God transcends gender, we are so used to using masculine pronouns for God that doing so becomes second nature. We don't even notice that we're doing it. In seminary, we were trained to always use gender-neutral pronouns for God to help congregants move past our rootedness in a male-only understanding of God. But I know that many of you have shared with us how much you appreciate how Pastor Jen will often refer to God using female pronouns in the service. I confess that even for me, every time Pastor Jen calls God she, my ears perk up. I notice right away because it's so unusual. But for most of us, our minds don't have the same visceral reaction when we hear God referred to as he. It's not unusual. We're just used to it. Every time Pastor Jen uses a female pronoun for God, I think of the question often posed to Ruth Bader Ginsburg when she became the second female Supreme Court justice, when she was asked, when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court? To which Ruth would reply, when there are nine. She said people were always shocked by her answer because people assumed that that was unusual for there to be nine. But for 192 years from 1789 when the Supreme Court was first established until 1981 when Sandra Day O'Connor was appointed, there were always nine men and no one raised any concerns because we were just used to it. So thank you, Pastor Jen, for helping us get used to female pronouns for God. Because if we have heard God referred to as a man for so long, perhaps we could benefit from hearing God referred to as a woman for the next 3,500 years of Judeo-Christian history. And then maybe we'll even out a little bit. Yet we also know that God is beyond gender characterization. When scripture tells us that God made both male and female in God's image, it is because God is no single gender, but encompasses all understandings of gender. As I mentioned a few weeks ago during our pride celebration, God presents in scripture as completely non-binary. And so all of the gender expressions that exist in society from being male or female or non-binary or trans or agender, they are all encompassed and represented in the being of God. I wish saying something like this was not so theologically controversial because it's pretty obvious in Scripture that God transcends the gender binary. And appreciating that aspect of who God is can help people of faith better appreciate the diversity of gender expression we see in society around us. Which is why the copious images in our Scripture readings today where the biblical authors have no problem presenting God as a mother, come to us. One of the most controversial religious works of art was a statue that was installed at St. John the Divine Episcopal Church in New York City in 1984 entitled Christa, which presented a female body crucified on the cross. I have a picture of it right here. The author wanted to highlight the feminine within the Christ figure, but the moment that this statue was installed in the church, hate letters began pouring in. 
Now, in 1984, they didn't have email or text message, so people had to be upset enough to sit down and compose a handwritten letter and put it in an envelope and put a stamp on it and mail it to the church. But there was so much vitriol and pressure that the church took the statue down after just a few weeks. And it wasn't put back into a church until 2016 and only for a temporary art showcase. I can tell you that within global Christianity today, many Christians are still more afraid of mammary glands than they are at the plight of refugees or mass shootings or genocide. My guess is that more letters were written to St. John the Divine in 1984 than people have written in 2024 to the White House demanding that we end the war in Palestine. We know that the historical Jesus did not anatomically produce milk, nor does God literally nurse anyone. But the point of divine imagery in Scripture is not to shrink our understanding of God because we're so caught up trying to perfectly describe the indescribable. Instead, it is meant to expand our understanding of God. God is so immense that there is no part of us that is not reflected in the divine. To only be comfortable with the standard imagery of God as a bearded white man sitting in the clouds ruling from on high is to support the earthly power structures that want us to believe, either consciously or unconsciously, that God is a reflection only of those who hold power or wealth in the world. But God is so much bigger than that. Anyone should be able to see themselves in God, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, Biracial, male, female, trans, gay, straight, bisexual, infertile, impoverished, homeless, disabled, neurodivergent, skinny, overweight, short, tall, with ADHD, depressed. God is all of those aspects of our identity and more. There is no part of us as divine creations that is not also part of God. And we can even go so far as to use that imagery. God is a woman. God is disabled. God has mental health challenges. Now that last image might feel new to us, but let it expand your understanding of God and not shrink it. Because we certainly have images in Scripture of divine mental health challenges. Now, the corollary to expanding our understanding of God is that we can also expand our understanding of ourselves. If God is disabled or has mental health challenges, then know that the mental health challenges or disabilities in your life do not make you any less human or any less made in the image of God. They are part of God's very self. The feminine imagery of God can help us understand that everything we characterize as feminine or masculine is simply culturally conditioned. God can be mothering and compassionate and emotional, not because God is a literal woman, but because we can all possess those qualities. A toxic masculinity that equates maleness with machismo and domination and control has married Christian nationalism, which has married the American church, creating a warped understanding of gender. But God, possessing the best of all of our gender stereotypes, calls us into something bigger, not smaller. As an antidote, to the dangerous dichotomies created by toxic masculinity, may the feminine images of God propel our community to be one where all of us will know how to mother with compassion and to fiercely love the people around us. What a beautiful, expansive image of ourselves that would be to carry with us home today. Amen.